the real takeaway is that there are at least 10 Du Boises uh, since he has nine decades of life. It seems to me that each decade there is a, another Du Bois. My name is Whitney Battle Baptiste, and I am a professor in the Department of Anthropology and director of the W.E.B. Du Bois Center at UMass Amherst. The W.E.B. Du Bois papers include scholarship, poetry, literature, correspondence, notes, all kinds of details of the, the work that W.E.B. Du Bois did during his lifetime. The amazing thing that we find in the papers is the relevance of what he wrote about and how it relates to what we're experiencing in this moment. The Du Bois papers talk to us in a way that I think is important for the activism that we're seeing now. He did not put the words Black Lives Matter together, but I think in his very astute research, I think that he was able to bring focus to the complexity of African American life in the United States. We have personal correspondence with leaders from all over. And what you can see in those personal correspondence are not the things that make it into the published material. They don't make it into um, the article or the book. And I understand, especially from our postdoctoral scholars and our graduate scholars that have come through, that the papers are rich with the perspectives that scholars never actually knew that Du Bois held. Du Bois's uh, great-grandson and great-great-grandson, um, sons, we, we were in kind of what we call the, the back vault where the papers are kept. And there displayed, we had three degrees from Harvard. And I remember saying, to myself, why are there three degrees? He was the first African American to receive a PhD from Harvard University, and he went to Fisk University. So why does he have three degrees? And then I heard the story of how Harvard did not accept or use his Fisk degree as a bachelor's. So he had to do a bachelor's degree at Harvard, a master's degree at Harvard, as well as a PhD at Harvard. And what that said to me was so incredibly deep and impactful because he doesn't write, or I had not found anything specific about what must have been a very frustrating experience to have been at a, what would have been equivalent to at least an associate, if not a bachelor's degree, that was not accepted by the school in which he had always, as a son of Massachusetts, dreamed as his ideal institution, which was Harvard. And it really helped me to see a tenacity and, and a commitment that Du Bois had even in the interim of those three degrees, he also studied in, in Germany. And I just imagined how much work and how much he had to think through and had to go through in order to get those three degrees, which are literally just three pieces of paper, but to me speak volumes about his experience at a place like Harvard in the late 1800s. Uh, and so uh, Herbert Apthecker, Shirley Graham Du Bois, um, David Graham Du Bois are key figures in, in this story. There are others as well. Uh, 
as Apthecker was editing Du Bois's archive, starting in the 1940s and 50s and into the 1960s, uh, as he was reading through correspondence, uh, and as Herbert Apthecker's wife Faye was also uh, reading through the correspondence and, and organizing the archive, uh, in addition to the Apthecker's daughter uh, Bettina, who uh, helped uh, arrange the uh, archival collection as well. In the midst of all, all of this uh, work, uh, by the late 1960s and early 1970s, um, uh, a, a chancellor and scientist at uh, UMass Amherst named Randolph Bromery was instrumental uh, in getting uh, the papers to UMass and in, in meetings with the Du Bois's lawyer named Bernard Jaffe with Herbert Apthecker, Bromery traveled to, to Cairo where Shirley was, was then living and uh, had discussions and meetings uh, and arranged for the sale and uh, shipment of the papers to UMass. People in this country, in fact, people in the world now are going to see what it was when I said how I felt after I read Du Bois. Because they're going to be able to see it. They're going to be able to read it. They don't have to have me come give them a talk and tell them how I felt about it. They're going to be able to feel that for themselves. And if, if, if Du Bois' impact on people outside the University of Massachusetts, people outside of me and others here are touched, even if a small percentage of the people are touched by the boys like I have been, you know, um, it's got to have a significant, it's got to have, uh, it's not going to just have a significant impact in Amherst, it's not going to have a significant impact in the U.S., it's going to have an impact worldwide. Yes. When uh, the collection uh, uh, was divided between Apthecker, uh, Fisk University, uh, and, and again another third went with the Du Boises to Africa. Well, after the coup in Ghana in 1966, uh, Shirley eventually moves to Cairo, uh, and that's where uh, the uh, latter third of the Du Bois papers uh, resided. And so this is this is the the part of the collection uh, for which uh, Apthecker. Uh, Jaffe and uh, Bromery met with Shirley. And uh, after negotiations and discussions and plans, and also with uh, a large amount of support from the UMass community itself, uh, particularly faculty uh, in the W.E.B. Du Bois Afro-American Studies uh, program, uh, the, the papers made it to uh, UMass, uh, and uh, Shirley sold the Du Bois collection to UMass in 1973 for $150,000. And at that point, the papers had to be uh, assessed uh, and uh, examined for scholarly uh, usage. And so they were, they were prepared for scholarly research. And so between 1973 and 1980, the uh, archivists worked tirelessly to prepare the papers for research. There were a number of ceremonies and meetings held to commemorate the opening of the Du Bois papers in 1980. Uh, there were seminars and um, uh, presentations uh, by scholars and activists who commented on Du Bois' role as a scholar, uh, Du Bois' role as a journalist as well as Du Bois' role as a public intellectual. And in some ways, the culmination of these festivities occurred with uh, a number of keynote speeches uh, and again, the opening of, of the papers. The other keynote uh, speaker at the time was Lerone Bennett, the public intellectual and editor of uh, Ebony Magazine. And his presentation uh, captured the importance of the papers uh, as uh, an intellectual artifact of a towering intellectual, but he also uh, emphasized the importance of the legacy of the Du Bois papers. And I'd like to quote from 
uh, his, his speech, his uh, address, uh, where he talks about his relationship to Du Bois, uh, to Du Bois's work, Du Bois's ideas. And he had this to say about the papers themselves. You read these papers at your own risk, he said. There is no point in talking about Du Bois and Du Bois's papers unless we are willing to do something within our own lives. Dr. Du Bois raised in his lifetime, and he raises in his papers the fundamental question of the meaning of scholarship. What is scholarship? What is scholarship for? Can scholarship serve the many instead of the few? Can it address itself to the problems of bread and peace and racism and militarism? Can it serve the poor and the lowly? Or is it destined to go on forever serving the rich and the white and the powerful? In the contract was signed in 1985 to write a biography. And so I would assume that probably about 86 or 87, I presented myself uh, at the top of the library. Du Bois, as, as I think uh, probably one uh, appreciates from the way in which I write about uh, his life and times, uh, was so much a part of my upbringing. Uh, he was uh, frequently discussed around the dinner table. Frequently people came who knew him and had opinions about him. And uh, I would uh, urge all scholars looking at Du Bois to step back and assume that what is the steady thing is an impatience with the failure of America, uh, with all of its abundance and all of its um, proclaimed ideals uh, to uh, fulfill uh, equal opportunity, uh, well distributed. Uh, and that he, it is simply a kind of Calvinism that came from the early years in Great Barrington that is always there. And as he gets angrier and angrier at the failures of the United States, especially after World War II, uh, when in an excess of triumphalism, uh, we <clears throat> make it impossible uh, to see the benefits of socialism or social uh, democracy uh, and stigmatize those of its own citizens who uh, are on the left, it makes him quite angry and he thinks it's unforgivable. And so he takes positions that um, uh, cause him a lot of difficulty, of course, uh, with both uh, his own uh, group that he has defended so splendidly, as well as with the majority population, as well as with the uh, government and uh, the establishment. Happily, the uh, offer from uh, UMass uh, was quite uh, sufficient, and not that I was trying to make money at all, it just seemed to me it was appropriate for what uh, what what would be added, and I'm just delighted that uh, that they are there. It seems to me there's a kind of goodness of fit, uh, and I've been delighted to see that the the uh, interviews have been uh, uh, so useful to um, fellows, scholars, and what have you. So in 2008, we applied for a grant from the Verizon Foundation um, to begin the process of digitizing the papers. Uh, and we received the grant, and it was really a push for us. It wasn't enough to do the entire papers, but it was enough to, to uh, get us started down the road. Um, and we began initial planning not only for digit digitizing a collection of that size at that scale, uh, but also building a system in order to be able to provide access to those to those scans. 
Um, there were very few examples, uh, unless you talk about something on the scale of Harvard or the Library of Congress, of, of really large-scale digitization projects like this in special collections. So we had to do a lot of things by scratch, um, particularly uh, the, the way that you describe uh, manuscripts, something that really hadn't been done that much, and there wasn't a lot of, of literature in the field telling us what to do and how to approach um, putting the descriptions that allow you to discover and search and, and find digitized manuscripts online. Um, we're able to, about a couple years into the, the Verizon grant, also apply for a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, and that grant, uh, uh, over $300,000, allowed us to really complete the project. The digitization took us uh, four, over four years to, to complete from beginning to end. Um, and we ended up scanning over 99,000 objects in the collection. And that probably that works out to, I think, over 400,000 individual scans that were done over the course of those four years. No matter what we do in special collections, uh, you know, even as we bring in um, collections that are on the level at, uh, of a Daniel Ellsberg, um, it is still all deeply connected and associated with the legacy and the work of Du Bois. He is always at the forefront of what we do, how we talk about what we do, and how we think about engaging the material in, in the archives here. Uh, the gentleman uh, next to me said, well, boy, what a fantastic fantastic collection that Du Bois collection is. And I said, oh, yes, it certainly is. He says, yes, I mean, it's all there. And I said, well, it certainly is. He says, I know, but any questions can be answered right away. And I said, what, what are you talking about? And he said, well, you know, it's a, uh, it's a credo thing. <laughs> so I said, oh, you mean the digitized? He says, absolutely. It's a model, you know. It, this is the template for huge collections everywhere. And I thought, my God, I, I knew about the digitizing, of course, but I'd never used uh, Credo. <laughs> and so I left the uh, Bancroft, went home, and I pulled up <laughs> the Du Bois papers and asked myself some questions, and they were just immediately answered. And I thought, well, you know, <laughs> I spent uh, two years on top of the uh, library, uh, <laughs> uh, maybe I should have waited. And the single most impactful piece of programming we do at the W.E.B. Du Bois Center makes use of uh, the papers um, as a key resource. In fact, the Breakfast with Du Bois, which happen every Monday in the Du Bois Center uh, or on Zoom if there's a global pandemic happening, um, make use of the uh, Du Bois papers 90% uh, of the time, I would say. Uh, sometimes, yes, we will read a chapter from a book by Du Bois. Sometimes we'll read a piece by a different scholar about Du Bois. Most of the time, however, we make use of pieces from the archive. And what this has given us is a unique perspective on Du Bois. It has shown us his thought developing, his radicalism developing over time. And we've seen him hone his opinions about the problems that he's writing about and uh, develop the ideas about how these can be solved. So as a group um, of faculty, of library staff, of members of the community, of students, of grad students, of Du Bois fellows that come together each Monday, we have learned um, in a sort of unique way uh, how Du Bois's um, development as a scholar and as a public intellectual happened over his lifetime. More than that, we've discovered in ways that are both inspiring and disheartening the ways in which Du Bois is relevant to our own time. I'm not kidding when I say that almost every week someone from the group will say, um, I can't believe this wasn't written yesterday. And oftentimes they'll be referring to a document that's over 100 years old. That The fact that it's been digitized almost entirely and that the digital archive is available to anyone with an internet connection, I think is one of the most profound legacies of what I understand as the spirit of Du Bois and the way he thought about knowledge and the connection between knowledge and freedom and the importance of education and access to knowledge 
in order to figure out how to become free or how to work for emancipation. So the fact that this archive, which would be only available to those close enough, if it were only a physical archive, is actually available to the entire world, wherever someone has an internet connection. And the fact that anyone can tap into this history and into this resource, I think is one of the most profoundly democratic and profoundly liberatory aspects of the Du Bois papers. The special collections of Du Bois is important for so many reasons. It allows us the chance to look into Du Bois, um, his ordinary moments, and even his extraordinary moments throughout his life during the tours at the site. In my job, I, I bring up everyday things about Du Bois letting the public know that there were moments where Du Bois was a normal person. Um, one of the memorable finds in the collection was a letter that Du Bois wrote to his grandmother when he was nine. I use that on the tour to allow children to see that Du Bois was normal. Um, du Bois did something as simple as writing his grandmother things that they can identify with, things they can connect with. Du Bois collection, the special collection, the papers, are important because archival spaces for African Americans is rare. And the fact that we have a collection that's accessible to the public um, to tell the life of of an African-American is, is highly important. And the fact that these, these papers, the items in the collection have been accessible for nearly 40 years is a testament to the significance of, of the work and the life of W.E.B. Du Bois. Saying one of my favorite pieces to work with in the collection is the Garrison Pledge. Um, I'm just holding up the top portion of it. And this is the pledge that Du Bois and others uh, created the first meeting of the Niagara Movement, which is considered a precursor to the NAACP. And some of their statements, and it's, I encourage you to look it up uh, sometime. It's one of the most moving pieces in the collection. Their pledge of why they're there, what they're going to be fighting for, that they will be heard. Um, but I use it with students a lot because it's actually cut and pasted on a survey that Du Bois was using a couple years earlier in his classes at Atlanta University just to collect data for his um, sociological work. And the survey is called Students in the Law, so it's aimed at students, at undergrad students, so it's great to use in classes. And I've printed out versions of these questions in classes and put them around the tables, you know, not the actual document, but printed paper, and students start to fill it out. They think that it's a survey for them from 2020, and I'll read you a few of the questions to think about why they might feel it's relevant to them. So students in the law from, I believe it's 1905 originally, have policemen ever helped or protected you? Have policemen ever wronged you? Have you ever seen a court in session? Did the judge and other officials act fairly? And we talk about in class how current that feels. So this could be something that they would be handed in class and asked to fill out. Um, we read some of the later questions which pre present language like chain gang, um, colored boys, some language that's obviously historical and starts to date this document. And so we talk about, well, when is it really from? Is it from the civil rights movement era, 60s, maybe 50s? Some people recognize this language as older. And then I reveal that it's over 110 years old. This, this item is, that they get to hold in their hands and look at is over a century old. And then what does it mean to them that Du Bois is asking his undergrad students questions that they today in 2020, 2019, whenever I was teaching, feel as relevant to them in their lives, right? That he's getting at these same questions. Um, is that moving to them? Is it heartbreaking? Is it interesting? Um, and I find it's a really a good way to get talking about his collection and about these documents as feeling like they're really relevant, right? That not only are you getting to hold them and touch them with your hand and engage with them personally, but the ideas are engaging you in your world. That there's content here that's going to be useful to you as a student, as a citizen, hopefully, and as you move through not only your careers at UMass, but as you move through your career trying to become someone who engages with society. Whoever in classes gets the passport is the hit of class. Students love looking through the passport, and I think it's because it's tactile, right? And we can see um, all of the canceled stamps in the passport and how much trouble, but also you know, look at the places where Du Bois was traveling late in life. 
Um, he's you know, giving speeches and engaging with countries all over the world, countries that, some places that were considered taboo during the Cold War. And Du Bois is, is going there and giving speeches. And maybe that's partly why he was running into trouble. Um, and so it's really fun to put these types of materials in front of students because they're visual, they're engaging. We can think about the span of Du Bois's life. There's really tactile material that it feels like a privilege for them. They're like, can I, can I look through the passport? Like you're giving me W.E.B. Du Bois's passport to hold in my hands and to look through and to see his signature and to see where he traveled. And I get to say yes. I get to say yes, please hold this history in your hands. And this is actually one of my absolute favorite items in the entire Du Bois papers. And it's not by Du Bois. It's certainly not the item you would ever pick out to frame or to even say, like, here's the famous man Du Bois. Here's the item from his collection, which is, as you've seen, impossible to do because they're all so rich and important. But this is a letter from his first wife, Nina, to him when Nina and their daughter, Yolande, are living in London in 1915. Yolande is there for school. And it's, it's mostly a domestic letter. It's about her education. It's about their lives there. It's about the weather. Um, it's about you know, their daughter being a little fussy and sort of going through her teenage years. And I love talking to students about that, too. Like, you know, this is 1915, but teenagers are still being teenagers. But we also get to a part of the letter where Nina is talking about their daughter coming into her racial awareness of coming to realize that she has a different background than many of the people that she's engaging with at school, perhaps, and in London, and what that means to her. Um, and we see Nina also reckoning with you know, the stares that she gets on the, on the streets of London, what their experience going to the doctor is like as American uh, women of color in a space where that was really sort of an unknown uh, foreign group. Um, you know, the doctor saying, what climate are you from? And she's saying, oh, dear. I have so much to explain to you, um, you know, and the war isn't even, even mentioned in this letter, and that's something we can talk to the class about too. So we have this family, these two women sort of engaging with what it means to have their identities in this space um, where they're really different. And we also can think about Du Bois as, you know, maybe more human as a family, as a family man, as a father, as a husband and also recognize that this family is separated. And is that because of his work? Is it because of their decisions about their educating? But really contextualizing him a little bit more concretely in time and in his family and in his community. And so as we commemorate the 40th anniversary of the Du Bois collection uh, this, this year, we remember not only the importance of Du Bois's extraordinarily uh, and intellectually productive life, but the passion behind his political commitments and how he centered black liberation and the, li and the liberation of oppressed peoples around the world. Du Bois's ideas spoke to the times in which he lived, but they also matter greatly to the times through which we are living. So may we all continue to honor Du Bois's legacy by keeping his words alive and putting into practice his ideas because our collective liberation today depends on the extent to which we pay attention to the history of W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, it is an honor to have the main library named after Dr. Du Bois. It is a daily reminder of the important legacy that we have as stewards of this vital collection. Libraries are symbols of knowledge and learning, and to have the library at UMass, named after Dr. Du Bois, is an appropriate tribute to someone who devoted his life to teaching and advocating for racial equality and justice. I also think many students are proud to see Du Bois' name featured on such a prominent building on campus. At this moment, it feels as though Dr. Du Bois is even more relevant to what is happening in the country around anti-racism and societal demands for real change. His work continues to influence not only current scholarly discourse, but also discussions of anti-racism on social media. It's clear that Du Bois's work addresses so many of the same issues that we continue to struggle with today, almost 60 years after his death. I think one of the most significant aspects of W.E.B. Du Bois' work and legacy as a scholar and intellectual and activist um, 
is his connection to so many other black scholars and thinkers and writers in the early 20th century, that he really served as a hub of a very wide and extensive network of leading intellectuals, leading educators and scholars, both women and men. And for me, that's one of the most significant aspects of his work and of his legacy is being able to trace the lives and work of black women leaders and intellectuals with whom he collaborated, with whom he strategized, um, and with whom he worked to promote the larger mission of black intellectual life, political activism, and education. Having the Du Bois papers at UMass Amherst is a fantastic opportunity for our academic community and our wider community to engage not only with the depth and breadth of African American history writ large, but also with the significance of African American history in Massachusetts and in New England. Often people only think of African American history as limited to the South or other distinctive regions within the Americas and don't realize the ways in which black scholars, black intellectuals, black activists were located all over the country and shaped the very nature of education and scholarship and activism across the United States and across the world. So having the papers at UMass Amherst highlights both the role of African Americans in the nation, but also in Massachusetts. If we better understood why and what other people thought was important in life, um, I think we could get along better and we wouldn't have uh, all the stuff that we have going on here. Now, what happens is I'm hoping that it has an impact on the world uh, to bring us back to what I think is the primary mission of higher education, is to train you to understand other people, train you the reason why, how can you use the information you gain as a in college and university, the better the world, because you got to live on it. Like I said, you, you can't stop it and get off like that play in New York. As the voices we heard today remind us, the W.E.B. Du Bois papers perfectly embody this commitment to ongoing critical exploration. For by creating global access to the life work of one of the most brilliant and influential thinkers in American history, we ensure Dr. Du Bois's voice continues bearing witness to what he called the problem of race in our country. As we celebrate the 40th anniversary of acquiring a collection of this stature and magnitude, we are immensely grateful for those who made it possible. We recognize the significant honor this acquisition brings to the university, and we enthusiastically embrace our responsibility to ensure Dr. Du Bois's work advances learning, discovery, and engagement. This occasion also has a somber dimension as we grapple with the challenges of a global pandemic and our national consciousness awakens to the pervasiveness of racism in our country. It is exactly in such a moment that we turn to Dr. Du Bois who reminds us of our past and how far we have come who sits with us in the present and shows how far we have to go and who inspires our future as we bring a renewed urgency to confronting our country's legacy of systemic racism. The university deeply shares Dr. Du Bois's commitment to socioeconomic justice and racial equality. And 40 years after acquiring his papers, his influence remains strongly relevant and we remain honored and grateful for the privilege of this stewardship. Thank you.